we're ready to continue with uh, Progressive Era Part 5. I'm hoping this will finish this up. I was hoping to get it done in 3, and here I am at 5. But we're looking at socialism, where it came from. This is not an economic history class, or we go much further with it. So I have to get enough out there so that you'll be basically grounded. Um, in terms of communism, Karl Marx is the godfather of communism, okay? It, the word may not actually appear in his uh, huge book published around 1869 or so, Das Kapital, which is German for capital, but um, Marx puts in play some very, as I said before, poisonous ideas. And in a way, why would anyone take him seriously? Karl Marx never had a job. Karl Marx never started a business. Karl Marx never worked in a factory or met a payroll. And yet there are people who sincerely believe that he's going to ride up on a white horse and show us a better way. <laughs> okay. Uh, we dealt last time with the theory of surplus value. A few other things to add to the... That, that would be the mainspring idea. But uh, also... Um, he took the idea that everything is politics and all politics is class struggle. Now, he lived in Europe, where European society was still uh, hierarchical and divided into various social classes, fixed social classes united by fixed grievances. That's the lens through which he saw everything, and his disciples see it the same way. Now, Marx himself stated somewhere along the way that he didn't think America, meaning the United States, was a good candidate for his ideas because we don't have fixed classes. Some people think we do, but there's a constant rotation going on. There's, there's um, social mobility with some people rising, some people falling. Uh, for example, the Internal Revenue Source reported service reported some years ago that uh, only less than 30% of Americans who were in the, say, the top 10% of income earners in 1980 still were in 1989, and and less than less than 30% of the ones who were in the uh, top 10% in 1989 had been in 1980. So they said, well, the rich got richer in that decade, so did the poor. So uh, socialism and Marxist inspired people they have to find something else to divide us but they assume division and uh, their, their their strategy their technique involves and since they really would like to get the United States out of the way or transform it into something that is weak and helpless so one way to do that is to to launch a, an attack on thought logic and reason you can do that by draining words of their meaning. Right and wrong went away some time back, I'm afraid. Now they're taking on such basic things as uh, male and female. But those really don't mean anything objective. Um, the Marx would insist, and this carries over unfortunately, that terms like good and evil, right and wrong, have no objective basis of meaning. As if you have religious beliefs, you would insist that they do. Uh, in his world, those terms only have meaning in terms of the struggle, by which he meant a class struggle. Since we don't have classes, it's assumed we're going to be divided along um, basically uh, racial and ethnic lines, the goal being to get us all clawing each other's eyes out, and they're doing such a good job of it. Okay, Marx wanted to insulate his followers from uh, logic. Okay, uh, teaching very early in his book that um, people's political views are determined absolutely by their social class. And the people he hated the most were the middle class. And so let me call the bourgeoisie, that's a French term, middle class, town dwellers. And that you simply need not pay any attention to bourgeois people because their, their views are determined by their social class and you need not pay any attention to them. Same thing with logic. Logic is a bourgeois con construct 
Therefore, you know, they're insulated against logic. Reason means nothing to them. We hear echoes of that today uh, at a time when I thought racism was all but dead in this country. What I saw was people getting along. We're moving into a post-racialist society rapidly. Now there are desperate attempts to revive the rotting corpse of racism. Best-selling books telling us that if you are white, and especially if you're male, that you are a racist, period. Flat out, it's embedded in your DNA. That sounds Marxist to me. And that things like logic is racist, arithmetic is racist, physics racist. That makes no sense whatsoever, but it comes right out of Marxism. Okay, so you have that. All right, um, who were the other main popularizers of socialism, okay? Um, sometimes fiction writers can have success with that because people are much more likely to accept ideas that come sugar-coated in a socialist um, camouflage, pardon me, in a fictional or literary camouflage than if they're, you know, preached at by zealots. A couple of examples, there was, um, um, let's see, you want to have to think of the guy's name. The book was Edward Bellamy. I forget whether he was English or American, but he wrote a kind of a time travel novel called Looking Backward, 1887 to 2000, or 2000 to 1887. He put the last year first. Uh, the story is set in 1887. The main character nods off for a nap like Rip Van Winkle and awakens in the year 2000, presumably in need of a shave. So in the story, he goes around and he finds that none of the social problems that bedeviled people in 1887 are still there. They're all gone. It's a perfect world. All the problems have been solved. Well, how did you do this? How did you do that? The answer is always straight out of socialism. Socialism had, had wrought that miracle. So Bellamy won countless converts to socialism just through something that did not have to survive uh, serious analysis. Okay, there was a writer around the turn of the century named um, was it Upton Sinclair? Anyway, wrote a book called *The Jungle*. A lot of high school students have read it. It um, is set in the meatpacking plants of Chicago around the beginning of the last century, and it has all this sickening stuff in there about. You know, dead rats, human body parts, spoiled meat being going into the sausage, all of that meat that had been condemned by the inspectors being shipped unrefrigerated over Europe, condemned there, shipped back to America and included in the sausage. President Roosevelt was reading The Jungle over a breakfast of sausage and eggs. Ah, he got to work. This led to the passage of the Pure Food and Drug Act and the Meat Inspection Act. Now, the author was trying to sell socialism, and he made up most, if not all, of this sickening stuff to sell the book. Almost like modern authors would put in a few steamy sex scenes for the same purpose. So he didn't win people over to socialism. He scared them with all his, uh, his wild stories. He said uh, he, uh, he aimed for America's heart, but hit it in the stomach instead. Okay. Um, Probably the leading American socialist was a labor leader named Eugene V. Debs, who uh, was a, a leader in a railroad union in the early 1890s. In 1893, there were some very serious strikes, including railroad unions that tied up the railroad yards in Chicago, which is the rail hub of America. And uh, Debs was convicted and went to prison for that because the strikes he led prevented the efficient delivery of the United States mail federal crime. While he's in the slammer, he reads up on socialism, walks out of jail a convinced socialist, and organized the American Socialist Party as a political party. Now, he is very thoroughly a democratic socialist. He does not go along with the violent overthrow or anything like that. Debs was also gifted with a very magnetic personality, and some people who followed him did so just because they loved him, rather than because of his ideas. You want to watch about that? You have your life before you, I hope. That's a long one. But 
don't just sell your soul to somebody because you find them attractive because you don't know what kind of a load of crap they may be trying to peddle. Um, anyway, Debs formed the Socialist Party, was their candidate for president three times, 1904, 1908, 1912. 1908, he got several times as many votes as he got in 1904. 1912, he got several times as much in 1908. 900,000 votes, nearly a million. That was 6% of the popular vote total in an election that had three other major candidates. This badly frightened uh, conservatives in both the Democratic and Republican parties. When a Democrat, this is a very rare thing in those days, named Woodrow Wilson won the presidency that year, uh, Congress, where people who would not have been interested in reform at all, they're so badly frightened by Debs' performance that they got on board for some preemptive uh, measures to make capitalism less threatening and to drain the uh, appeal of socialism. Now, by the time of the next presidential election, World War I had started. By the time after that, we'd been through the war, and um, there was a huge backlash against anybody outside the mainstream. Socialists became came to be blamed for almost everything. So they had some very rough sledding after that. But as of about 1912, just over 100 years ago, socialism was the fair-haired child. Three dozen major U.S. cities had socialist mayors who'd been elected as socialists. They weren't trying to camouflage it. So Eugene V. Debs. Um, more from the uh, communist side would be a labor leader from out west named William Haywood, better known as Big Bill Haywood. Uh, he was a leader in the Western Federation of Miners, which carried out what historians with a straight face call a war with the Colorado State Militia. Big Bill Haywood uh, helped organize the Industrial Workers of the World, also known as the Wobblies, and their idea was to organize the entire working class into one big union. That's their watchword, one big union that would be capable of bringing capitalism to its knees. They're not interested in shorter hours, higher wages, vacation, pension, any of that. What they want to do is tear down the entire uh, market economy and replace it with something far more radical. Okay, Big Bill uh, got in trouble for uh, uh, some kind of interference to the war effort in World War I. He was uh, uh, indicted on federal charges. While awaiting trial, he jumped bail, fled to the new Soviet Union, in which socialists of his trap placed great hope. They were extremely hopeful. This, at last, what we've been waiting for, a system based on fairness and justice and equity. Several went over there, including a very prominent journalist named John Reed, and they were uniformly disappointed, usually bitter, dis bitterly disappointed, disillusioned. Haywood, I don't know if he was or not, but he couldn't come home without facing charges. He died in the late 1920s. Uh, he's buried in the Kremlin Wall under a plaque honoring him as a hero of the revolution. Not the American Revolution, the Communist Revolution. So, anyway, we live in a time when the communists are making their move. All right, uh, let me see if there's anything else I just have to do with this. Okay, the, the lineage down to the present day, I've got just about a minute to do this. Uh, progressives, as they were known then, and today, if someone calls themselves a progressive, they probably mean they're really a socialist, if not a communist. But they want to camouflage that because socialism still carries some very negative baggage. Okay, they were the institutional ancestors of reform liberals who flourished in the 1950s, 60s, 70s. John F. Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, Hubert Humphrey, you may only vaguely be aware of them. They were reform liberals. They were staunchly anti-communist. They still saw the government as having the power to solve social problems. Okay, the socialist of that time, uh, the present iteration would be uh, utopian socialists. And I'm going to have to add a tag to this, a little, little next one, which is going to be um, part six.